Good afternoon. My name's Dr. John Graves, and today's presentation is See New Things in Act. It's a talk about big data. I'm uh, substituting for uh, a Ned a Lecture, who was going to talk about building front ends in Dash, and I really wish I, he had been here, because I would love to have, have seen that talk. Uh, Dash, who, who's used Dash? It's a, uh, uh, if you've heard of R Shiny, it's the Python version of that. It lets you, you surface an interactive uh, dashboard of capabilities uh, on, a, on a website for, for surfacing insights, uh, or data analytics insights, I think could be very useful. Uh, so since today's talk is a, uh, a substitute talk, uh, I, uh, I have to give you a, a little bit of a, a background. It's, it's also uh, the sequel to a, an earlier uh, a talk. I've uh, uh, been working at this company, Curious, uh, for uh, uh, a little over a year now, and I do have a, a PhD from this institution, AUT, uh, and an MBA uh, in um, finance. Uh, and uh, as part of my work with uh, at Curious, Curious is a Spark venture. We we ingest about um, three billion event records from roughly uh, two million unique uh, mobile phone uh, and tablet devices that are uh, in use in New Zealand on any given day. Uh, so we, that's, that's quite a torrent of, of data that we have to, to deal with. Uh, and of course, what we, we need to be able to deal with them are our algorithms. And, and my earlier talk had a, had a bumper sticker uh, that uh, you, the, the takeaway message was, was better algorithms, better performance. And I, I find that algorithms are something that uh, typically uh, business people that we, we often deal with as clients don't have a good grasp of. I'm sure you all understand them, but I'd like to give you this uh, hand computing tool to help you explain algorithms and the performance of algorithms to those uh, less fortunate. And uh, so first of all, let's just start off with what is this number? Four? No, that's wrong. I, the, the, the correct answer, I think, really should be it depends, because the, 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 the algorithm that you've used to determine that these are four fingers here is each finger counts for one. Now, well, wait a minute, that's a one, that's a one, that's a one. If I had the number one, 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 what's that number? One thousand one hundred eleven. As soon as we take the same number and put it on a piece of paper, we use a different algorithm, which involves this notion of place value. So, place value is a really truly revolutionary method of dealing with uh, with numbers, uh, as well as the concept of zero. So, what is zero in in the scheme of, of place numbers? It's a placeholder, right? So. We also looked at this immediately and said, well, those are four fingers. Well, it didn't always used to be that way. You could also count the joints of your fingers. So what would this number be using that algorithm? 12, exactly. Now, have you ever given any thought to this odd situation we have in the world where the, the day is divided into how many hours? 24, that, you think? The 12 on the front of your hand and the 12 on the back of your hand might have contributed to that. And look, we've got five on the other side, and there's five times 12 is 60, 60 seconds in a minute, 60 seconds in an hour. The fact that we use these numbers to keep track of the minutes and days of our lives relates literally to our anatomy. The way our hands are shaped and divided into 12 joints. 50 years ago in this country, people used a kind of coin called a shilling. Any idea how many shillings there were? 20. There you go. So when you start working with numbers that have um, uh, place value, as computers do with binary, you can use your hand to count to something other than 4 or 12, you can count all the way up to 15. All right, let me take you through this. Place value in the binary system, each digit will be twice the, the value before. We start with 0 or 1, 
2, 4, and 8. So just right away, if you add those numbers together, 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1 is 15. So count with me to 15 in binary with your fingers. Ready? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So if you've gotten up to holding up three fingers, that's 7. Your pinky, that's 8. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. <laughs> Yeah, it takes a little bit of practice, but you can win a bar bet with this. <laughs> but you can even do better. So uh, anybody work with uh, like the colors uh, for, for web design? And you're always seeing these like FF and AB. So you're, you're, if we've got two algorithms now, one place value and one counting with joints, if we combine them, we've actually now got base four numbers to work with. Now, this is even more complicated, but you're, you're gonna do this. We're, we're gonna count to 15 on just two fingers, okay? The powers of four now are one, four, 16, and 64, but each finger has zero, one, two, or three of those. All right, so now let's think about this for a minute. That means one, two, or three, four, 12, or, uh, 4, 8, or 12, uh, 32, another 16 is 40, now 16, uh, 32, 48, right? 64, 128, and 192. So 192 plus 48 is 240 plus 12 is 252, plus three, 255. Now 255, I'm sure you all agree, is a very important number that everyone should know. It's the maximum value of one byte of information. Now how many knew that you could use your four fingers to count up to one byte of information? Eight bits. We'll, we'll do the, um, the uh, Four bits on, on one finger here, ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Ah, I'm sorry, I forgot to count it off for you in hexadecimal. <laughs> you should have stopped me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A, B, C, D, E, F. F, F. What color if I do F, 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 F for Green and FF for blue. White, yes. And you can do it with your own hands. So it turns out that over the course of the last, well, gosh, it's going on 60 years, the, the world of uh, computer science has expanded to cover every uh, letter of the English alphabet. Oh, by the way, in that one byte of information, there's 64, 65. That's the capital letter A. And you know that the lowercase letter a is 32 higher, not 26 higher. So uh, 97 is your lowercase letter a, and you can keep counting. There's a number for every letter. There's a number for each of the colors, as we've seen. There's a number with just uh, 16 bits for every level of a frequency of sound. And then it wasn't until 1996 that we wound up coming up with the numeric codes for every symbol of every language. So Chinese characters, Egyptian hieroglyphics, uh, but, but this, this is getting uh, to be old news, right? What all of these capabilities added together have done, along with Moore's Law, is make our mobile phones capable of doing much more than the original analog cellular phones we can now read anything, we can listen to anything, we can take pictures of anything or make movies of anything. Your, your iPhone and the, and the 4G networks and what's coming with the 5Gs is, is a, a ubiquitous kind of computing where everything is big data. And that's why we need, we need skills and we need an understanding of how uh, the, this data can be manipulated. That was my first talk. This was the better algorithms, better uh, performance, and now I'm ready to give the talk that we're here for today, which is uh, see new things and act.
So See New Things in Act is really a, a, a digest version of this book called Everybody Lies, Big Data, New Data, and What the Internet Can Tell Us About Who We Really Are. So who's used Google Search? Who's used Google Search for something that you might not want other people to know? <laughs> So the, the premise of this, uh, this book and the, uh, this author's research is that Google Search is actually the best sort of uh, anthropological tool that's ever been invented. Because unlike any survey where you get asked what is it that you use the internet for, people say news and shopping, when you actually look, it's porn. So <laughs> everybody lies. So he, he maintains that there are four superpowers for, for big data. And I've got a little shorthand way of remembering them, which is see new things and act. And I'm just going to take you through each one of those. Seeing. So what big data enables us to do is to look, as, as Google does, uh, in your Google location history. Who, who's, who uses Google Maps? And who has uh, enabled this feature and gone and looked at their timeline? All right, so this, this uh, example, for those who haven't, is, is my, my travels around New Zealand in the recent past, and each one of those red dots, the, the other talk I gave, was down in, in Wellington. The big data that Google has collected about my location history, Grant, are you in the audience? I, I, my colleague, uh, I gave him my location history recently, and uh, I think it was about 12 megabytes of my location for every five minutes for the last five years. A uh, fa fairly significant amount of data, and that's just me. Uh, so big data gives us the ability to see this big picture. This is, this is everywhere I went, but it also gives us the ability to drill down. So you can pick a particular day, and here you can see on that Friday evening I went to that particular restaurant. Now I think this is really quite a remarkable feature of, of the Google's algorithms, that they're able to see not only where I live and where I work, you see those have been actually labeled on the map. Uh, but it, it's, it tells where I ate dinner on Friday. And if it, if it knows that, that fine level of detail about me as an individual, and it has this big picture of my overall activities, and it can do this for um, the entire population, then it has the ability to uh, create insights that are, are about the big things, the big patterns of movements and who's where when, but also this long tail of very unique kinds of observations about you know, where a particular person went to eat on a particular day or the set of people that ate at, at that restaurant. So this is a superpower of big data that's unlike you know, a traditional survey which has to you know, consider it just a sample. It might not pick up some of the patterns in that long tail. New. What's new about big data and the fact that, uh, in the case of Google here, we're able to get down into the, the behavior at a particular place is that we can create a new kind of insight. Have you Googled up a, a restaurant or, or destination and had this part of the, the search results tell you when that place is going to be busy and how long people typically spend there? This, this kind of insight wouldn't have been possible without big data unless you had somebody sitting there with a, you know, a, a, a stopwatch and, a, and a, a keeping records for, for all of the visitors to every single restaurant. But Google can do this because of their uh, repository of specific individuals at specific uh, restaurants aggregated and then analyzed uh, from this, this time perspective, new insights are possible with big data. Things. So as the author maintains, uh, when you're looking at what people actually do, what are they searching for? His actual conclusions in the book were, were kind of startling. He said uh, that Americans have the desire to uh, be politically correct. And if you ask them if they're racist, of course, they'll deny it. But if you then look at what the search histories are, you find that there are actually people who are going 
where is my local KKK branch? Hmm. Or you know, how, what, what can you tell me, Google, about white supremacy? And um, then he was able to say, I can pin down which parts of the country are more likely to have groups of people making those kinds of searches. And darned if that map of the United States didn't overlap almost precisely with those parts of the country which voted for Donald Trump. So things is the ability of big data to get at what people actually do. Which web page do they click on? Which button on which page do they click on? Or in the case of Google, again, and their locations, if I wanted to go from Eden Park to that particular noodle shop, Google would tell me how busy the road was going to be along that route. Again, it's a behavioral insight that's only made possible by their continual polling of your uh, device's location, even as you're driving along in your car. Act. So I maintain this is the biggest uh, advantage of, of having big data, is that you can use this tool, Google Analytics. It's by far the, the most used analytical tool on the planet at the moment, because you can get at what drives people's behaviors, and you can optimize their behaviors. And I think what's going to happen in the very near future is the, the kinds of optimizations that Google has traditionally been able to offer uh, for um, online interactions are spilling over into the real world. And we're going to find that the rate at which that driverless car arrives at our address when we want to use it is going to be significantly decreased by algorithms which are able to process this uh, flow of information about you know, when we want to move and uh, uh, predictively uh, uh, you know, put vehicles where we want them to be, and so on. Everything about you know, uh, supply chain log logistics uh, has long been uh, mediated by algorithms, but it, it's, uh, with the Internet of Things, this is going to expand into even, even more parts of our lives. Despite the, the um, compelling, I would say, reasons for there to be uh, uh, big data in virtually every business that you can see the new things and act upon them, businesses, by and large, haven't adopted big data technology. But I think there's something new that's coming along that, that could dramatically change this picture. Everyone's familiar with AlphaGo? All right, so this has been alluded to, this uh, uh, deep mind back in um, March had uh, created a program in a long tradition. You know, IBM originally created a checkers playing program, which, which beat the best human chess checkers player. And then they came along with the, the um, you know, beat Kasparov with Deep Blue in the game of chess. And then they ventured into natural language processing with, with IBM Watson and, and one in the game of Jeopardy. And then uh, it was Google's turn here uh, to, to come up with what many thought was going to be a, uh, a very difficult challenge uh, to, to win in the, in the game of Go. I mean, if, how many of you looking at that board would know where you would place your next stone? You know, <laughs> that's, that's a little complicated. But what they, they didn't stop with beating the human best, they, they took it one step further. And uh, this paper was uh, uh, just published uh, in uh, October, and the blue line that you see uh, working its way up and beyond the purple line is the performance of uh, a second Go playing system called AlphaGo Zero. And, and I think some of the commentators seeing this result have, have suggested that this is uh, another milestone in, in the progress of artificial intelligence and, and, and an indicator of where we may be going in the future with regard to machine learning. The system which beat Lee Seedall, uh, the, the, the human contestant, was trained on uh, the games that master humans had, uh, Go players had played, as well as uh, you know, additional training. AlphaGo Zero 
The reason it has such a terrible, terrible low score, this ELO rating here, is it began with random moves. Never looked at a single human player's game, but began playing it against itself until it mastered all of the, the strategies and, and with reinforcement learning, it, for those who aren't familiar with the concept, you don't actually know how to update the weights in your model or to improve it until you've actually reached the end of the game. And then the reinforcement gets propagated through all of the strategies and, and, um, and techniques that were used to win. Within three days, AlphaGo Zero had taught itself. This is a game that had existed in humankind for thousands of years. You know, millions of people have played it and tried to become the masters of it. And here this computer has mastered the game from scratch in three days. Well, of course, it played nearly five million games against itself in that time. So practice makes perfect, right? <laughs> so the, the bumper sticker for this talk is uh, see new things and act. The other talk was better algorithms, better performance. But I think the real takeaway message here is that for all the superpowers of big data, the future lies in learning from data. And well, big data is said to be uh, the new oil, I believe it's learning from, from big data that is the new oil. And with that, I'd really like to open this up to questions since I'm a senior data scientist at Curious. And uh, I realize we have some people that are, are curious about um, Curious or uh, data science. Uh, we are hiring big data engineers at the moment, I could say, <laughs> as well. So uh, anybody have a question about data science? Yes. OK, so uh, the question is, where do you get data from? And uh, in the case of uh, the founding of Curious, uh, we're a Spark venture. Uh, the, the premise was that we would get data from cell phones. So uh, each cell phone connects up to a, a tower every time it's uh, communicating any you know, SMS message, uh, data request, phone calls, of course. Don't get many of those anymore. Uh, and uh, that data all gets uh, uh, fed over to uh, Curious in an in a aggregated, a, uh, an anonymized way, and then we aggregate it into insights. So we, we've had a, a product in the market uh, that uh, particularly, you know, tourism is uh, New Zealand's largest uh, um, export business at the moment. The biggest part of the economy um, relates to the visitors that we get in New Zealand. And uh, I was very surprised. I thought, okay, we're looking at individual unique devices that, that come onto the network every given day. And, you know, New Zealand has a population, call it 5 million. How many unique devices do you think are in our database? We've been collecting data for about two years. 20 million, 20 million is, is actually a good guess. Uh, it's at, uh, right at the moment is uh, 14 and a half. And, and the reason is we get plane loads of people that as soon as they step off the plane, the first thing they do is they look at their cell phone. And that means it connects up to the Spark network and we get a record in our data. And then two weeks later, they've gotten off uh, the, into the plane and taken off again, and then another 10,000 arrive, then another 10,000 arrive, and that happens every single day in this country. And um, consequently, over the course of uh, years, we get way more uh, foreign visitors than we actually have uh, domestic residents. Now, how many of you have multiple SIM cards? Right, so uh, there's also that phenomenon that there's churn in, in the subscriber base, and uh, some people actually have multiple phones and things like that. The, the, the question about where we get our data from, though, it, it ultimately comes from our, our uh, other clients. And so uh, Curious has, has served government. Uh, we uh, finance, healthcare. Uh, we're, we're really quite a, uh, much um, across the board. And then we look to open door data sources uh, to augment that. So we, we pull in uh, things like the census and weather data and uh, you know, different kinds of analyses. Uh, always involve different uh, kinds of, of data, which is part of the fun of it. But you know, we, we do have a, uh, a significant um, ETL kind of process, along with an, an analytics process, and then a, uh, a data delivery uh, you know, insight uh, process, which uh, is why I'm interested in that Zappa. You know, so I, I can make a chart or a graph now and, and Zappa it into the, 
AWS Lambda, and, uh, and now I can you know, just send somebody a URL and, and they can look at that or interact with that. In the back. Hi. Um, I was just curious to know what you take away from the AlphaGo Zero experience. Um, I look at it that and I think to myself, um, Go is a game that I would struggle to play with any competency. And here's a machine that in the space of four days is beating the best humans on the planet. Uh, so that's enormously impressive. But at the same time, Go is, a, it seems to me, is a very closed domain. It's a, it's a, it's a very difficult thing for a human to do well. Uh, and yet at the same time, it's a very sort of limited sort of thing, really. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious to know, do you draw a line from that to... I don't know, you know, an android walking down the street and doing everything that a human does as they walk down the street. Because it seems to me that is a massively multi-dimensional, massively more dimensional task than playing Go. Yeah, the, the, the question um, gets at how general can we be with artificial general intelligence? And uh, the, the reality is that we start small. We start with solving problems that are seemingly intractable, like playing checkers, and then playing chess, and then playing Go, and then recognizing images within objects, and then having the recognition of those objects drive the controls of a vehicle, a motor vehicle, which used to employ somebody called a truck driver that we now don't need anymore. And so when you say you're concerned about how you get from solving Go to something that matters to us in the real world, that's the way I make the connection. It's a, an accumulation of skills that uh, one analysis that I read just yesterday suggests humans may be like horses. And there was a point at which machines simply had much better capabilities for generating power, providing transport, and so forth, so that the horse population, at least in the United States, and which was used in the study, you know, dropped by 90%. And it uh, may be that the work that people are currently doing could disappear at a similar rate at some point in the future as the skills of the computers multiply. And I really think it's a, a policy question and something that you know, we're, we're gonna have to face at some point. Um, the, the thing that excites me is that you know, we're all here. We all are able to think about this and gain the skills that will enable us to build some of the systems that will yeah, maybe put a few people out of work, but we're also building systems that are gonna help people to learn. And we're gonna help uh, people use 3D printing to create the goods and you know, sort of material wealth that we can benefit from at a far, far lower cost. There, there are ways in which the world is gonna be transformed into a world of abundance. And you, know, you, you just really may not need to have a job if you know, pretty much everything you need can be you know, created you know, with solar power driving automated equipment at, at very, very low cost. Yes. Hey, um, my question's maybe coming back a little bit to the data science. You mentioned you get your um, information from Spark. Yes. So given these two other carriers, do you just kind of extrapolate or do you assume that maybe customers of other networks behave a little bit differently based on maybe they're cheaper or more expensive or... How do you kind of fill in those holes, I guess? Yep, that's an excellent question. We, we, we typically do just provide a, an extrapolation factor to cover off on the fact that, that, that Spark and Skinny only have a, a limited market share uh, within New Zealand. It varies between about a, a third of the Auckland market to uh, very close to half of most of the, the South Island. Uh, and um, uh, interestingly, we actually can have some insight into uh, the uh, amount of traffic on the other networks uh, because Spark is, uh, you know, the uh, offspring of telecom. We, we actually own the whole backbone. So when, when somebody needs to move data from some place to another, they actually still wind up coming in through our, our wholesale network. And, and so we actually have some, 
some evidence about uh, uh, how often our, our subscribers are making calls into numbers that aren't ours. So that also gives us a, a perspective on, on precisely what the, the relative position of, of, of market share is. So we can, we can make some fairly uh, uh, reasonable um, extrapolations. The thing that gets really tricky, though, is all of the people that get off the plane. Remember, we're, we're talking that, uh, about these international visitors as being the, the sort of key to the puzzle here in New Zealand. And, you know, some of them just use their phone. They roam. Some of them come and the first stop is the uh, Spark store, we hope, in, in Auckland Airport, where they pick up a, a, a SIM. And then how do we tell that that is actually an international visitor? That has been a very interesting problem for me to try and, and come up with a, uh, what we call the uh, international local SIM segment of the market, where uh, it turns out that, for the most part, I can look at those uh, devices that are, I, the SIM identifies the country of origin. I know that they are a, Ch a Chinese uh, phone, and then I can say, all right, the Chinese phones go to the casino. And then I can say, okay, here's another local SIM that went from the airport to the casino, must be Chinese. And, and I, I uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's an assumption. You know, there, there could be some, some uh, locals who do the same thing uh, every time they come to Auckland to gamble. Next. Uh, John, uh, just going back to the gentleman at the back, following on for that, his question. Um, don't you see uh, like a crude correlation involved in what you're doing and um, policy uh, ramifications in terms of uh, kind of uh, non-rational discrimination in terms of the context dropping of things you know would have an impact, but you're not including them because either you don't have the data or because you've got to keep your data set simple enough or something. or of that nature. So uh, you gave an example of um, Trump earlier uh, and drawing an, uh, a correlation. Oh, right. Yeah. So uh, that not, not to imply example. that every Republican is racist. No. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is that um, big data has, has been fingered already for this. It, it, it's, uh, you know, the, the white Anglo-Saxon bias, you know, uh, we, we just don't have that much representation of, of minority voices in the building of artificial intelligence at the moment. It's just a fact. And, uh, and consequently, the systems that are, are being designed um, you know, just sort of make assumptions almost subconsciously. It's, it's like we haven't gone to that extra effort to, to uh, um, protect against our own uh, prejudices. And, and so I think one of the things that has always impressed me about PyCon and, and the Python community is, is our sort of uh, uh, emphasis on diversity and, uh, you know, Pi ladies and, and bringing uh, uh, additional voices into this discussion. But I think it, it needs to happen even more. Uh, and uh, that if we, if we don't do it, there's going to be people who are going to get hurt. And it, it's kind of unintentionally. And just as a result of... Uh, uh, systems, you know, that are, are meant to score mortgages and help a bank, you know, to, uh, to optimize their loan decisions, uh, marginalizing a group of people, you know, simply because, uh, you know, they have, they have uh, the wrong skin color. I just want to ask, how do you deal with noisy data? And uh, what sort of a process you do for data mangling? All right, noisy data is a fact of life. Every data source that we get has got uh, noise in it, uh, uh, has got uh, missing values in it, uh, and uh, oftentimes has uh, this uh, distinctly challenging problem of it's the data that some person put in there that they thought was right at the time. <laughs> Which it looks like it could be good data, but it really is oftentimes uh, not. And so you, you begin to realize that uh, Computers have a preference for, for things that are, uh, you know, systematically and reliably and repeatably true. And, and this is why the Internet of Things could be such a big deal, is because that sensor that's telling, you know, what's the temperature in this room and how much electricity was being used for the air conditioner to make it be that, is it, something that you can measure 
you know, as many times an hour as you like. And as a result, the, the decisions that are being made based on that data can be um, uh, modeled. It, it can be something predictable. So when we get junk, uh, one of the simplest things that we do is to try and abstract away from it. So we don't look at things at the granularity of of the data as it's delivered. You know, just make histograms of, of uh, you know, kind of the values that have been uh, supplied and bin it. And then you look at the stuff that is, is in the outliers and then maybe decide that those aren't even appropriate for your analysis. But you get an idea of, um, you know, where the signal is, what is likely to be noise, and then you come up with really effectively a compromise solution that um, uh, addresses that question. Um, what is your software stack for storage and compute? All right, we have a variety of uh, um, methods for, for going from, you know, raw to insight. Uh, but our, the Curious is really built uh, in, in terms of its, its product delivery pipeline on um, uh, Hive and Hadoop. Uh, so uh, we do have our own on-prem uh, uh, Hadoop cluster. Uh, and uh, there's um, another part of our business that uh, uses uh, the Google traffics data that we, we looked at alert earlier, uh, and we can uh, generate insights out of making calls into that API, and all that's now on, on uh, AWS. So um, we've worked with uh, you know, NoSQL databases, and um, uh, we have Stood up next to the Hadoop is a, a Postgres Greenplum instance, so we can also do you know distributed uh, uh, SQL queries into that. I personally really like this kind of combination of um, Jupyter notebooks with the HD5 format. Anybody familiar with this one? It's a scientific computing. Um, uh, it's virtually a memory image, so it's very quick to get it uh, down on disk and get it back into your your pandas uh, data frames um, with a, a simple uh, pd.hdf store uh, sets up the, uh, the relationship and then you uh, can store multiple tables in, in one of the files. It's like a dictionary. So you know, store you know, df equals df uh, means that there will be a, a data frame uh, with that, uh, that data content in your file store.close and you're done. So it's a really simple way, you know, that you're, you're not having to do a whole bunch of, uh, uh, you know, SQL alchemy kind of magic to, to just get access to your data. Um, hi. Um, your, my question is around uh, privacy of uh, the users. You're using the data of, um, you know, um, users who mm -hmm. use your network. How do you ensure that the privacy is not violated, or how are, are they aware of the fact that you're using their data for these kind of analytics? There are small print in the Spark and Skinny, uh, you know, terms and conditions. To get to the data, I have a swipe card that gets me into my office. I have a key that gets me into my locker. I have a password that gets me onto my laptop. I have an RSA key that gets me onto the VPN, and then. I can ask a query. And if that's not enough security to keep some hacker from uh, coming in from the outside, um, we have a, 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 a pen testing service that we use to make sure that uh, our uh, VPN is secure. And uh, we have um, a guy named Guy Kloss. And remember, Guy is uh, with NZ Pug um, on our staff, and, and he's kind of one of our, our security experts. So we, we take uh, security very seriously. Uh, all of the data we get from Spark and Skinny has been um, uh, anonymized. It's all been hashed. And so uh, while I can see a pattern of movement, I don't know who it is. I can't, I can't tie it back to any customer record or any even phone number. All I know is an, uh, this hashed ID and uh, uh, the series of uh, cell towers that that device has, has connected up to. And again, our goal isn't to track people, it's to, to look at aggregated insights. And so, you know, we're really concerned with things like you know, how many visitors, uh, you know, came into Auckland in the last month. And then what does that look like 
as a time series, uh, you know, over time. Yes. Okay, Python is my go-to uh, tool for, for data analytics, and that's not just me. Uh, Google recently acquired Kaggle. Kaggle did a survey, 16,000 uh, results. Python is the number one data science tool uh, in the world. Uh, yay! <laughs> uh, and uh, I think Jupyter Notebooks are, are really one of the uh, most significant uh, advances in um, uh, sharing of data analytics insights based uh, on, on Python. Uh, although you can now use, you know, Julia and R and other kernels within the, the, the Jupyter environment. Um, I, use, uh, I use pandas. I, uh, I use uh, a number of uh, related uh, sort of geospatial libraries. Um, and I think there was a talk about geopandas. You're giving it. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So if you want to learn more, go to that talk. If you want to learn more about how you actually get your hands on, uh, uh, some big query data with Python, that's the following talk. So I think that's time for this talk. So thank you.